So loads of folks sent me this article about how Hyperloop has begun construction. It's really happening. Hyperloop One is building a Hyperloop out in the desert. Actually, no. They've just started welding together the tubes they've had sitting around for years. But it once again got me thinking about tubes under vacuum, like say for instance this tanker truck. With this demonstration, we hope to provide you with a window into the dynamics of a vacuum collapse. We welcome you to utilize this video in employee and stakeholder training. And it got me thinking, is this how the Hyperloop is going to end? Now, there will be some who say, but the Hyperloop only runs under a partial vacuum. I mean, let me just put this in terms of a graphical representation. Here, I have 255 pixel depth of color. So basically, 255 is white and zero is black. So here is 125. That's going to represent about a 50% vacuum. 20 is going to represent about a 90% vacuum and 2 is going to represent a 99% vacuum and the Hyperloop is going to be a 99.9% .9 vacuum according to the Hyperloop Alpha document. Arguing shades of grey here between left and right is literally hundreds thought was a valid argument to negate my debunking of the Hyperloop is farcical. So yeah, the Hyperloop runs under one thousandth of an atmosphere, which is so close to a perfect vacuum that it's not even worth distinguishing for this video. Now, firstly, let me say that Elon Musk's attempt at a test track was much better than this, in that it was at least a kilometer long. So the test track they built was about four-fifths of a mile long. The tube is 4,150 feet long. Seriously, they couldn't even build a mile-long test track and even at that that's the second largest vacuum chamber in the world yeah and and so we, we got the i'm told this is like the maybe the second biggest uh, vacuum chamber in the world after the large hadron collider so it's uh kind of exciting and that's only one four hundredth of the actual size of the proposed californian hyperloop whereas the hyperloop one is only half that length and that's it. That's everything, which is bloody pathetic. I mean, even in the one kilometer long test track, you can do almost nothing. 30 kilometers an hour, 40 kilometers an hour, 50, and so forth, up to 60, 70. And it's released the pod, and the pod stopped. <laughs> uh, have to go maybe, I don't know, 50 meters or something. Elon Musk decided to host a competition. He told the world, come up with Hyperloop designs and let the best design win. Indeed, the winning team actually only managed to go slightly further on its own. So here we go, the push is off and it's accelerating the pod. 30 kilometers to that, 50 kilometers, 60, 70. Wow, it's a record, 80 kilometers an hour, 80, 90 kilometers per hour. And it releases the pod and the pod stops. One of the things this competition is for is to show the world that we can do this and convince them that we should build it somewhere and get the ball rolling. Their top speed was about 60 miles per hour. 60 miles per hour, 100 or so kilometers per hour, which means that you go the full length of the track in about one minute. And that's it. That's the top speed of the Hyperloop competition. Just about... 900 kilometers per hour short of what they promise in every goddamn article that speculates about the Hyperloop. Hyperloop, a massive solar powered tube, would allow passengers to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco in less than 30 minutes. It's going to be able to reach, in theory, speeds of 700, maybe even 800 miles an hour. Just to get from LA to San Francisco in 35 minutes, there's, there's almost nothing else like that. Our aim is to connect the world like never before in history. What the internet did in the sphere of communication, Hyperloop will certainly do in the realm of transportation. But seeing this thing hover and seeing it move, is so futuristic, but it's really right around the corner. You sit in a pod and are catapulted through a depressurized tube at over 700 miles per hour. And travel at speeds greater than 600 miles per hour, with tickets costing less than a seat aboard a plane or train. Awesome. So 80 kilometers per hour. That is a fantastic speed and you guys have set the bar for the remainder of the teams. 
Yeah, they always promise a thousand kilometers per hour and remarkably short transport speeds of like 45 minutes. Whereas in reality, that's just how long it took just to get something in to the test track of the Hyperloop. Because this is such a large chamber and it takes a lot of power and a lot of uh, resources for us to pump it down, we want to make sure before we put the pods in here that nothing is going to happen to them under a vacuum. Different teams want to go to different pressure levels, but if we go down to like a fairly low level, it'll probably take about 30 minutes. It takes longer than the proposed journey time from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Would allow passengers to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco in less than 30 minutes. Just to get in to the Hyperloop. We're waiting for Delft to do their run. Um, they put it in the tube about an hour ago, then they took it out and they put it back in. In fact, with some of the entries, it was more like an hour and a half. And then they took it out and then they put it back in and now it's in and it's being pressurized, which takes about 30 to 45 minutes. It is six o'clock. The ceremony is supposed to be about 435. So yeah, they just welded together all those tubes they had sat out in the desert. But it did once again get me thinking about how much energy it would actually take to pump down the Hyperloop to a vacuum. Now it turns out it's trivial to work out the total amount of energy to get the vacuum out. This isn't actually the energy you would need to pump it down. This is the absolute minimum, the thermodynamic limit to remove all of the air from the Hyperloop. And it turns out it's just pressure, which is one atmosphere, 100,000 pascals, times the change in volume. That's it. That's your energy in joules. So let's take Elon Musk's Hyperloop, sorry, his micro loop, the one that's 1,000th of the size of the LA to San Francisco Hyperloop. And we'll take the small version of the tube. This is the smallest possible version, 1.6 meters tall. I couldn't even stand up in that. And let's say it's well, one kilometer long. That means the volume of that tube, the volume of the vacuum you have to create is about 2000 cubic meters. You've got to displace about two tons of air. And the minimum energy requirement to create a vacuum that size is about 0.2 gigajoules of energy, which is about the same energy as 50 kilograms of TNT. That's half my body weight, eh, give or take, of high explosive. And that's it, if they had a vacuum failure, it would be firing a capsule down the track like a ping pong ball in a vacuum demonstration. So now we're pumping it down, pulling the air out. Three, two, one. Whoa. And basically the energy it would release on the impact of the end would be about the same energy as 50 kilograms of TNT, which really made me feel kind of uneasy about just seeing all these people standing around this really quite dangerous vacuum tube. So yeah, just in creating that vacuum, you stored a lot of energy, which is one of the reasons why when we're in labs and we're dealing with vacuums in glassware, they're frequently coated in plastic, such that if there is an implosion, it catches all the fragments of glass. I'm gonna hit it even harder. Whoa! Because there's a lot of energy in a vacuum under an atmosphere. And if you have a thousand kilometer long hyperloop, it'll have 1000 times as much energy in it as the micro loop. That is, it would have the same energy as 50 tons of TNT. And that's using the small tube, the one I couldn't even stand up in. Which brings us back to the new Hyperloop, which they've started welding together in the desert. Well, their steel is bloody thin, to the point where when it's sitting around in the desert, it needs cross braces in all of the tubes to stop it buckling under its own weight. Ha! Huh. Have you ever seen what happens to a tanker truck when it's pumped out under vacuum? But the Hyperloop's gonna be made out of thick steel, right? Yeah, steel that still needs interior struts to protect it from defamation. Take those out and this may well be what happens to your full scale Hyperloop.
However, while there are some very dramatic demonstrations of things under vacuum being crushed by the atmosphere. And this is basically releasing that energy that I was telling you about earlier. There was, however, a Mythbusters experiment that showed that a tanker truck under vacuum can be stable. That's the sound of disappointment, ladies and gentlemen. These tank cars are actually pretty tough little bastards. And that's until I put a dent in their tanker truck. And then, boom. Now something tells me that your chances of being able to stop any dent whatsoever in a 1000 kilometer long tube are small to nothing. I mean just things like wind strain or expansion strain because so far none of the tubes that they've created have dealt with the expansion issue in any way whatsoever or just simply an earthquake. Hell a car crash into one of the pillars any slight dent in that wafer thin tube and you would be looking at a cascade failure that would release about the same energy as five Moab bombs.